So tonight's topic is on shame, and um, shame is 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 a incredible, actually it's debilitating um, thing that we've all many of us have gone through. And um, so what I want to do, I want to start out. If you have your hand out, there was a prophetic word that was released. Um, there was a prophetic word that was released at Gloria Zion. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. I don't even know. And I'm just going to, I want to read this word. Ladies, do you mind? Okay, thank you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm talking about shame tonight. <laughs> anyway, so I just want to read to you. I just thought it was so powerful. My friend sent this to me, not knowing that I was teaching on shame. And so anyway, I had the word t- typed out so that we all can... Um, Um, you know, hear what the Spirit of the Lord was saying at that time. So um, there was someone that came up and and released a a word in tongues. And so this is the interpretation of it. Shut the door on the shame of past. Shut the door on the shame of your widowhood. Shut the door on the shame of your upbringing. Shut the door on shame. Shut it, shut it, shut it, shut the door. Then Chuck said, for I say to you, shame and mistakes from your past have even reformed the cells that flow through your body. I say to you, I I am even now reforming your cells, causing your cells to flow in ways they've never flown before, flowed before. Things that grew extinct from other seasons. I can call the cells of that extinction to come alive, and that which was extinct can bring Uh, can produce new life again. I say to you, I am reforming your cells. And even like birds and animals that have grown extinct, I can bring to life because I am life. I say, I can bring the life in your cells. What has gone to sleep, says the Lord. Just that alone, right? All right, so then this girl, Michelle, sings. She, She releases a song of the Lord. And it says, empty yourself, let it all go. I'm about to fill your cup, and it's going to overflow. My glory is going to surround you and overtake you. So empty yourselves and let it all go. I'm about to tip your cup over. The glory is about to flow, about to rain down and encircle and engulf you. So let it go. So that's the word of the Lord tonight. Let it go. And then Amon said, the Lord showed me a picture of a snake shedding its skin. And the Lord is saying, I've already called you to a new skin, new cell, new body. So why don't you just get rid of it? So we're getting rid of shame tonight, right? And so then in this, uh, Chris says, in the natural, we've seen a honeybee that was classified as being extinct. He said, but the Lord brought it back from extinction. And he's doing that in each of us. And then Leanne saying, so we shut a decisive door on the past. And we agree with you, God, for a new beginning. We shut the door to the war that went before where we fell bruised ourselves in, in war. And we agree with you when you say, come on, stand up, kick, kick that thing and begin again. Come on, stand up, that, that season's past, begin again and again. And then Robin ends it with this. The Lord says you're going to begin to understand that my blood is creating new realities for you that it goes deeper than you have ever known. Begin to uh, create things you know not of. And the Lord says, this season the church will stop negating the power of my blood. It's my blood that creates a new way, a new living word. I mean, a living word goes before you and clears the path and creates a new reality for you. As I was looking at what they had up there, the blood as working with us, the glory was stirring inside of us. And we thank you, Lord, for the blood in Jesus' name. It's so powerful. So, you know, the Lord, the word of the Lord to all of us is we, we need to shut the door in shame because shame, as you all know, and we'll see tonight, you know, really prevents us from flowing in the identity and the, and the power of God, um, you know, and what he wants us to do. We, we don't we don't move forward. You know, we have a difficulty in moving forward because of shame. Right. And so I'm convinced that shame is the most debilitating, crippling tactic of the enemy. And he knows what to do to prevent us from fulfilling our destiny. And, and, you know, and, and he tortures us with this. And there's the whispers and the lies of, of, you know, how we don't measure up and we're not good enough and, you know, et cetera. So that's the thing that we're going we're gonna to really address tonight. And um, this was something I had battled tremendously. And, um, and, and, you know, it was something that I just was so tired of. And I had to make a decision to want freedom. 
And that's where we have to all get to. And, you know, the enemy loves to rehearse everything that we've gone through, but God wants us to rehearse his promises and the victory that we really do have in him, okay? So, um, you know, one thing with shame, shame makes you feel that you're the mistake, that you're the flawed individual, right? Um, You feel like there's something broken inside of you. And I don't think I have any of that on your handout. But um, maybe you feel like you're never able to please God, right? You, you, you know, or you can never please another person or you have to pretend that you're somebody else. And, you know, um, that if, if the person, you know, that you're dealing with or people that you're dealing with knew the real you, they wouldn't want to be around you, right? You feel that everything has gone wrong in your life and it, that no matter how hard you try to fix yourself, it doesn't work. It doesn't get better. And... Um, so there are several words for shame in the Bible, and shame, um, one of the definitions for shame, it's, all, it, it's pretty much related, I think I have this on your handout, um, is, uh, is it carries with the thought of humiliation and represents the feeling of public disgrace, disillusionment, uh, a broken spirit being confounded. It, th- some of the words that have uh, regard to, to shame is disgrace, to taunt, to insult, to dishonor, to disgrace, scornful whispering, to devastate, and nudity. Uh, Webster's Dictionary says it's a painful feeling of having lost the respect of others because of improper behavior, incompetence of oneself or another, dishonor or disgrace to bring shame to one's family, a painful emotion excited by a consciousness of guilt and shortcomings, a feeling of humiliation. One of the um, references I looked up said uh, shame was an inner sickness or a disease of the soul, right? And expresses itself through inner torment. This is, it's emotional pain associated um, with lies that, wait, I'm sorry. The emotional pain associated with shame comes from what we believe to be true about ourselves. That's not really true, right? So, B'nai Brown wrote... Um, shame is the secret behind many forms of broken behavior, which we know. And shame is intensely uh, painful feeling or experience. I can't read my handwriting. Um, that, that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. I mean, think about that. What, what does God say? What does the word of God say? That he is love and he wants us to experience his love. Shame prevents us from getting to that place of intimacy with the Lord because we don't feel we're good enough. We don't measure up, and it's it's more of a covert feeling, and, you know, we want to always withdraw. We want to isolate. We want to play it safe. We want to protect ourselves, and, 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 and the enemy knows all about shame because when you read in Ezekiel 28, he was shamed. When he was thrown out, his, the, the Bible literally says that his covering was shame. So he knows that it causes that separation from God. He knows how powerful shame is. And really, just like rejection, you know, like I said, if you're alive, you've experienced shame in your life. But some have it more, you know, worse than others because of different circumstances that we endured growing up, all right? So now, the guilt and shame are different, right? So guilt, um, you become guilty because of something you're done, you've done, but shame is different where it says you're flawed, you're, 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 you, you see yourself as a flawed individual, that you're ashamed, that you can never measure up, or, you know, you always have to make excuses for you and pretend you're somebody else. I remember, I remember being in grammar school, sitting there, and just writing my name and, and just writing all different names so that I can pretend I was somebody else. And, like, I was even hearing my own name was an embarrassment to me. And so, um, you know, you, you feel so worthless and um, people enslaved to shame are constantly apologizing for who they are, right? I mean, we hear it all the time. We're never good enough. We we'll never amount to that person. That's where that comparison trap comes in, too. And then, of course, the media, you know, with even for, like, the women, you know, with all the, the, the airbrushing that they have with the magazines and, you know, make everything look flawless. But that's not true. But, I mean, you know, you try to compare yourself. You try to look a certain way, and you're never satisfied. You're never happy. It's never good enough. You're never going to look that good, so why bother? So then their isolation comes in. And, and, it's, and you can't be vulnerable 
Because if you're too vulnerable, then they're going to really see what you're like and they're not going to like you. Wow. They don't, they, you remember when I was talking about rejection, um, I, I would never just invite one person over or like a couple over. I had to invite others over because if it was just them and us, they're gonna, I felt sorry for them that they had to be with us. You know, I mean, my husband didn't have those issues. So I had the issues, you know, so I mean, it was just so crazy. But at the time it was so intense you know, that feeling and you just feel so inadequate. And then what happens is you, you get into this performance orientation thing. And, and we teach that in a lot in the um, possessing your vessels and where everything has to be perfect. And if it's not perfect on the outside, you know, you have a fit or everything on the inside has to be perfect. And, you know, you're just trying to create a false reality. And the pressure that we put on ourselves is, is unbelievable. And it's not God. And high, shame is highly correlated with addiction, depression, hopelessness, violence, suicide, all types of eating disorders. Breaking free from shame could be a process, as you know. And, and one of the key things for me, and I know that this is going to be for many others, when, when I was really going through this, the Lord said to me, you have got to learn to embrace the word, the word of God regarding his love for you has to be final. Now, we all know that here, but we have to get it here. And and I thought, well, how in the world am I going to do that? And so then it was just simple by faith, Lord, I choose to believe your word that you love me with an everlasting love. I mean, I studied the Song of Solomon. I mean, I, I just got through so, uh, chapter one and two. You know, and, and I would just I would just spend time there. A friend of ours from um, that we met through my mother-in-law, Jamie Lash, wrote a wonderful uh, devotional called "The Kiss of Day," and um, that really helped me. And I, I I did not want to read it. I have to be honest with you. I thought oh, I don't want to read this. And then it was the thing that the Lord had me read. And as I started to study it and really study the Song of Solomon, it was life-changing for me about the love of God and how He is ravished. Do you know, he, it says in Song of Solomon 4, it says that he literally is ravished by each and every one of us. That he, he, he waits for us. He longs for us. He loves us. His mercies are new every morning. He's a loving, kind, you know, his loving kindness are new every day. And he loves wow. us with an everlasting love. And, but yet we, how many times do we, we we're like, oh yeah, okay, God, you know, I'm coming before you right now, but you know, we're at arm's length because we're afraid. But look at the people in, uh, in the old Testament, the Israelites, weren't they afraid? You know, you know, they said to Moses, look, you know what? We want to stay outside the camp here. We don't want to get close. I don't want to be that person. God is calling the church. He's calling us into this intimate place with him. We've got to know our identity. We have to know our relationship with the Lord that he wants to give us revelation. He doesn't want us just having head knowledge. You know, I was reading, uh, this was my little thing that I saw the other day. I was reading in uh, Matthew and you know where it says, where my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And I mean, I, I look up every word. I always just look up every word, you know, my phone. I have that phone app. And den means cave, but it also means to be in hiding. Now, what's the thing that shame causes us to be in? Hiding. And so what does the enemy try to do? Prevent us from getting into that place of prayer and intimacy. We are the house of the Lord. He's talking about us. He's not talking about a church building. He said, we shall be a house of prayer. But shame prevents us because you don't think you're good enough. I had somebody say to me that when they, um, when they, were, when they would blow it, <laughs> right? When, when this person was struggling with pornography and he said that, when he did that, he was so ashamed that he said he wouldn't pray or read for weeks. Wow. You see, that's what it does. It tries to keep us separated from getting into the intimate place with the Lord. And that's what we need. Listen, we're the ecclesia. We're the called out ones. God is calling us. We are all revolutionaries within us here. We have opportunity to make changes in our neighborhood, in our sphere, in our, you know, obviously in our families. And, but, it, but it takes that, that, that time of really entering into that secret place with the Lord for the revelation we need for this era, era that we're in. That's right. 
And we can't go about it the way it was. It's just God. It's like, Lord, I know you love me with an everlasting love. And Lord, I'm, I am seeking you and I will wait on you. I will wait to hear the directions. I will wait to hear. I'm not going to get so consumed with the voice of shame that shame's voice is louder than the voice of the Lord. Shame's voice saying, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. You're always going to be this, you know, flawed individual who can never get it right. That's the voice of the enemy. Whose voice is louder? And so that's where we have to say, no, 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 I reject that lie. I reject that lie because this is what the word of God says. So the enemy's goal is to torment us, to upset us, to deny us rest, you know, and bring us out of God's peace. He wants us to feel unloved, unworthy, unacceptable. And he wants us to, pre and he wants to prevent us from living the life that God intended for us to live. I said, no, devil, I'm not giving you that anymore right you're not great you didn't graduate you don't have a degree you don't wear suits you're not good enough you don't earn enough money you're this you're that and he's always going to say something he just need him telling him to shut up say so, well you know what here's what god says about me this is what the word says that i'm the head and not the tail that i can do all things through christ who strengthens me it didn't say if you were good enough it didn't say if you were tall enough it didn't say if you were pretty enough it didn't say if you were rich enough that's, that's the world's way. You, they make fun of you. The, the world's way puts you down if you don't um, look a certain way and you don't act a certain way, if you're not in a certain social status, you don't have the right color skin, you know? You're not black, you're not white, you're not white enough, or you're too white, you know? I mean, come on. You know, the Asian people, I mean, all this cancel culture nonsense. If you don't know who you are in Christ, you're going to buy into all that lies. And so that's where we have to say enough is enough. But I'm telling you, the word of God has to have final say. We must know the word. The word says that, 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 that we can do all things, like I just said, and that, that he wants that breaker to come alive within us. We have the Holy Spirit. We have that breaker anointing within us, you know? And so, uh, you know, we're not going to allow the devil to hold us back. So anyway, um, so... Shame, what are some of the doorways here, all right? So it could be a result of a traumatic incident, you know, growing up, sinful experience, stuff that you've done. I've had people say to me, I can't forgive myself. Well, you need to forgive yourself <laughs> because the Bible says that God says if you don't forgive, he can't forgive you. So if you can't forgive yourself, I mean, it's no different than me not forgiving Kathy. It's the same thing. We have to choose to forgive ourselves. And when we're ministering in deliverance, a lot of times people have the most difficult time forgiving themselves wow. because of past mistakes. So, you know, that it's, it's something, it's Lord, I choose to forgive myself because when there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of self-hatred. I hate myself. I hate the way I look. I hate the way I talk. I hate this. I hate that about me. I hate. You see, we've got to break those word curses over ourselves. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's People right. have cursed themselves to die. Amen. And, and what, God is love, and we're to be imitators of him, and we're not walking in love. And you can't walk in love towards others if you hate yourself. Right? right? So it's, it goes, it's, it's, it's contrary to what the Lord is saying about ourselves. It causes us to isolate. You want to hide all the time. Everything has to be perfect. If it's not perfect, I can't have you over my house. I can't have people, I, we, you know, we just can't get together. I, my, this isn't great enough. This isn't, you know, I mean, come on. After a while, it just gets old, and the Lord's like, really? You're saying this again? <laughs> I died on the cross, and I got to hear that you're saying to me that you're not perfect? Of course you're not perfect. None of us are perfect. But anyway, so, what, so the other uh, way that you can inherit uh, shame is through generational issues, right? You, you see it in your family. A lot of it's uh, uh, behavior. I mean, it's habit, too, and seeing how everyone in your family behaved and the secrets and, and or, you know, you know when you're, um, well, I, I wrote here, as a result of training or teaching, parents have discovered that shame was an effective tool. So how many of you grew up and you would hear your mother say, shame, shame, shame on you? Shame on you. Shame on you. Now, I know most of our parents didn't mean it, right? They, were, they thought they were helping us, right, Linda? My mother, shame, shame, shame on you. You know, and then we went like, mm. you know, and certain people would get passive. I got rebellious. You know, my thing was like, you, know, you call them shameful, you know? And even though I did believe it, but then I got really 
rebellious and that didn't work. So when a child, now listen to this, when a child is shamed by their parent, there's abandonment issues that take place because there's like that separation. It's like I'm not, you know, I didn't measure up to my parents. So you're in, in the effort to reestablish that con connection, you try to be perfect. You try to do it better. You try to, you know, achieve this and you, you're looking for their affirmation. And then if they don't get it, if you don't get it from them, because they're, you know, how many times parents were just so negative. And, and if you don't get it from them, they're going to try to get it elsewhere. Now, again, I'm not bashing parents. Everyone has done the best that they could, yeah, right? right? And um, so we, we turn to others or other things to establish our self-worth. And so this can lead to a lifetime of dependence on addic you know, addictions, perfectionism, and, and to always look for approval of others, all right? What about, being in, what about in school? What about being bullied in school? What about at times when I had to sit outside my classroom? <laughs> the teacher made my take the desk outside, I had to sit outside. You know, that was, you know, but <laughs> it happened. But what about, or else you had to stand in the corner, you know, in front of everyone. You know, you're devastated as a kid. What was it called? Nose and toes. Oh, Lord. But, you know, and, and in our school, I mean, the, the people got hit. And, of course, you know, I'm telling my, the person in front of me who was getting hit, who was such a good student, hit her back, you know, don't take that from her, you know. <laughs> I wasn't a good person to be around at that time. But, you know, you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, this, they're crazy here. I have to protect myself. And so, uh, you know, the one teacher, I said, you hit me, I'll hit you right back. I said, don't even go there. So I had to repent. <laughs> but, you see, you get so rebellious, and then you feel bad, and then you're ashamed. I did. I felt bad. But, you know, thank God um, I didn't get hit. But um, anyway, so they, they would single you out or, or shame you over things. And uh, I was, uh, we had, I grew up in inner city and I grew up in Patterson and we had a lot of Colombian kids that came into our region. And um, we had a lot of the, the, the rich white girls that would want, they wanted to mess with the Colombian girls. And so I thought, oh really? So I said to them, I stood in front of the Colombian girls, you mess with them, you're going to have to go through me. That wasn't very good, let me just say. <laughs> well, I made some dumb, dumb choices. But, but so there was a lot of friction, if I can put it that way, growing up in the school system. And so the nuns, you know, they, they didn't, you know, like me very much. So they, they got, they were a little mean, right? And so, um, you know, but, but I'll tell you now, you know, I laugh. I had to go through a lot of forgiveness and forgiving these people because of how mean they were. And, um, and then the final straw that really did a number on me, I mean, it literally broke my spirit, was um, we were writing, we wrote or drew cards and wrote kind notes to our one nun, and she was really kind to us, and we really loved her. And I wrote, <laughs> somebody told me, I wrote, drew a grindstone, and I said, welcome back to the old grindstone. I didn't think that was so bad. Well, I got in so much trouble for that that I was penalized and I wasn't allowed to be with my classmates. She put me in the class with the Colombian girls and um, I was horrified. I was so embarrassed and ashamed over that. And you know, then you hear the enemy say, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything. You cannot achieve anything. You can't write, you can't read. I mean, it, it really did a number on me. And so you say, oh, but that's silly. No, but you're a kid. And so you start, you, you t it's, there's an imprinting that takes place, and you believe the lie. Right, and um, the Lord, it took a while. I mean, the Lord had to really help me with that because I became so one with that lie that um, it became a part of me. That, that became my reality. And, that, and so in my identity, and therefore, you know, that's why I would get so, so feisty and so angry because then what happens is you get so enraged by that shame, and it's a cycle that happens. And, and so I said, Lord, I, I don't want to live like this any longer. And so, 
you know, you, so you, you, there's self-shame, and then you, you, there's fear, then there's torment, and you're afraid to step out. You're afraid to, to even accomplish anything because you're afraid of failing. And then if I fail, oh, my gosh, I'll be ashamed again. You see that cycle. And the Lord's like, girl, this is too much. What are you doing, you know? Just, just let me free you up. And um, so I had a lot of these issues. And when I married my husband, he helped me through it. I tormented him, let me tell you. Oh, Jesus, did I torment him. But, oh, amen, honey. So you can have shame. Let, let's think of, of kids that grew up in a single-parent single, single parent household. Um, you know, at the time, you know, because at the time when we were kids, there wasn't as many divorces as there is now. Or even now, I, mean, I can only imagine what some of these kids go, go through with some of this crazy stuff that's going on now. And so um, shame through child abuse. Or, or verbal abuse or physical abuse, right? Uh, shame, you know, you have it two ways. You can be ashamed of your parents. I remember, you know, my mother came from Italy, and I remember being in the school, and I remember feeling ashamed because she didn't speak English right. And she had, uh, you know, and um, she had her accent and broken English. And I remember as a kid thinking, oh, God. Because remember, already I'm, I'm, I'm drowning in shame. I have all these issues. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, now I have my mother who doesn't speak good English. And, you know, are they making fun of her? And, you know, so you would get angry if they made fun or if you thought they made fun. Because a lot of times it's your perception. It's not even that people are making fun. But then it was just the shame of not being like everybody else. So I remember feeling ashamed of that. Or, or else, what if I remember uh, uh, kids, um, it doesn't matter the names, that, that lived in our apartments. We lived in apartment buildings, and uh, their parents were alcoholics. And the one time I went to the house, uh, it was terrible. We were there, and the father was really drunk, and he started to hit the mother. And then we, we were so frightened as kids. We were about maybe seven or eight, and there was an, a, a coffee table, and we, we turned it over, and the mother kept saying, Frank, her, his name was Frank, let them out, let the kids go. And, and they're throwing, they were throwing, glass was breaking all over the place, and we were crying when I tell you how frightened we were. These kids were so ashamed of their parents. Like I, I remember as a kid feeling so bad for them that they saw that I witnessed that, you know. So, you, you know, you have different things like that. And so the enemy torments us with shame. Like our, now these kids, you know, what they went through because their parents didn't measure up. So it, shame devours our self-confidence. You have no self-confidence. And, and it works hand in hand with pride because pride then says, I can't let anybody know. So then you're stuck and you're so ashamed to let people know all the junk you're going through. And so anyway, so what are some of the fruits of shame? You isolate. You can have a mental breakdown. You withdraw. Um, you know, Satan's goal is to destroy your soul, period. Yeah. All right. So I like what I read. This, um, some, I read something where it says, shame works silently from within you like a cancer to destroy. It works silently within you to destroy you. And, and so it can lead to suicide, it can lead to different phobias, person, you know, explosive personalities, or extreme self-focus, that you have to look and be perfect. If you're not articulate, if you don't sound perfect, if you don't have an education, extreme self-focus. If a little hair is out of place, you're devastated. I'm, I'm not kidding you. And there's extreme issues there. But that's, again, it's, it's rooted in that, that shame. And, and God, you know, says, I came, Jesus said, I came to set you free. Yeah. You don't have to live like that any longer. Now listen to the scripture. When I was looking up scriptures, I have, I think I put on your handout, Zechariah. That was a mistake. It's Zephaniah 319. And it says, behold, I'm going to deal at the time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. Another version said, I will turn their shame into praise and fame in all the earth. Wow. That word shame there is B-O-S-H-E-T-H, which means shameful thing, disappointed, or confused. 
you get confused about your identity, get confused right. about who you are, right? Yeah. Oppressors there, that word means those, he's saying, listen, I'm going to deal with those who look down on you. I'm going to, I'm going to deal with those who try to banish you, is what he's saying. And so I love that. Behold, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will turn your shame into praise and fame in all the earth. And so what the Lord is saying, he's going to heal and fix everything that we've struggled with. Jesus died on the cross. He doesn't want us just going to church and we go through the motions. He wants us to go and be the example, be the light of the world, say, this is what Jesus did for me. That was who I was, and this is who I am now. This is who God called me to be before I was in my mother's womb. All right? So he wants to deliver us, and I'm telling you tonight, he's going to turn our praise, our shame into praise. And this is the very beginning. So with that, when I looked up the word, that shame, where it's B-O-S-H-E-T-H, I was thinking of Mephibosheth, right? And so his name is spelled M-E-P-H-I-B-O-S-H-E-T-H. So he has that, that portion uh, that, uh, uh, you know, in his name, did, you know, so we're going to talk a little bit about it. So in 2 Samuel 4, I'm not going to read, I'm going to just paraphrase and tell you. So it starts off in 2 Samuel 4. And then uh, in 2 Samuel 9 is where this whole thing's going to end. But I, because of lack of time, I'm just going to talk about it, all right? So I, are, is everybody here familiar about with Mephibosheth? Yeah. Lord knows I can't pronounce half these names. But <laughs> anyway, I'm not ashamed, honey. I've been set free. <laughs> so he's the, he's the grandson of King Saul. And at the end of King Saul's uh, reign, he went a little crazy, you know, and he forced David to be in exile because he was jealous and insecure. Remember I told you, uh, when, for those of you who are in a class, and, uh, when I was teaching on rejection, it says uh, Saul was hiding amongst the baggage, all right? So we know he had issues, okay? And so he was very jealous of David. And, um, you know, Saul's son Jonathan and David were really good friends. And... Um, you know, and Jonathan actually helped David escape his dad's insane plots. I mean, you know, you saw how many times he tried to kill him. And so, but Jonathan and Saul lost their lives in battle, all right? So when Mephibosheth, nursemaid, nursemaid heard the news of Saul and Jonathan's death, her name is Ziba, she, she grabbed Mephibosheth, he was five years old, and, and went to run because what they would do when one reign ended, what they would do is kill everybody who was in that prior reign. So you can understand her fear. And so she was afraid that vengeance, uh, David would come and take vengeance, and she dropped Mephibosheth and crippled. I mean, they were saying in the commentary, it says they probably, his legs probably were broken, and they never set him properly, so he was lame. And so, uh, so obviously, so poor Mephibosheth was seriously injured. So, you know, now he has issues. You know, now he had a crazy grandfather. You know, his dad's dead. And, and now he's on the run. He's, he's, he's in hiding because he's afraid that now David's going to come after him, take him out. All right. So, and just think about this. Here he is, five years of age, and he's dropped. It wasn't his fault. Just like for many of us, what we've gone through, it wasn't our fault, right? He was dropped, and, um, you know, and it was someone who, who he trusted, right? And so many of us, there were certain situations that, that we, you know, that occurred in our lives that it was from someone we trusted, wow. and we were dropped. Wow. And... But the Lord always, there's always redemption with God. There's always redemption. So, so he was living in fear of David's retribution, thinking like, oh, my gosh, I mean, if this guy finds out where I am. I mean, well, listen, he's the king. He can find out where you are. <laughs> so uh, then one day, you know, and I love this. And this is, just, this is just the spirit of the Lord. It's the representation of God's covenant with us. David in the Bible said, is there anyone in the household of Saul to whom I can show kindness? Now think about that. Saul was the one who was trying to kill him. And, and, and they said, yeah, you know, there's Mephibosheth, and he's living in Lodabar. And so, you know, here I'm thinking Mephibosheth thinks he's hiding, just like we think we're hiding. We're hiding our stuff, but everyone sees the stuff. You're like, what's up with that person? You know, you think you're being real cool about it, you know. <laughs> but people are reading your, your mail, and they're saying, God, something's wrong with that person. 
and they're, they seem so cold and so stuck up. And what's their problem? Meanwhile, you're afraid. You're afraid of getting close to someone. You're afraid of letting them know who you are because what if they don't like me? What if I say something wrong and they think I'm stupid, you know? It's, see, it's a lot of work. There's so much freedom in Christ. You don't have to think like that, right? So listen to this. So Lodabar, he said he was living in Lodabar. And Lodabar means without pasture or no pasture. What is that? Wilderness, isolation, lack. When I looked it up, it literally said that Lodabar was a ghetto town. <laughs> Just living in a ghetto town like, oh, Jesus, you know. And so he, it seemed like he was in a hopeless situation. Right. Just like many times here. Sometimes you're so like immersed in your stuff that you can't, you don't see a way out. But see, God knows. He, he knows the end from the beginning. Yeah. He always knows a way of escape. He knows how to get you out. Amen. But it's, it's just surrendering. It's yielding to him. It's, Lord, little by little, I know that you're, you're going to, you know, set me free from this thing because he died to set the captives free, right? Yeah. He came. He was manifested to destroy the works of the enemy. All right. So, so, uh, anyhow, so, so, um, God wants to show kindness to Mephibosheth, right? And so, he, you know, David's the one. He's saying, isn't there anyone? I just love that. And um, so here's what I, I just think is just so amazing. How when I looked up the name, now Mephibosheth, right? In, in um, oh, I forget, uh, Easton Bible Dictionary, I looked it up. His name literally means exterminator of shame. Isn't that awesome? So here he was named exterminator of shame. The Lord knows the end from the beginning that you're going to destroy that shame that try to take you out. Because, it, you know, it goes on to say that, you know, David, uh, you know, welcomed him in. And, and I'll read it in a minute. It says that, um, you know, he was, he was, he said, I'm going to have you sit at the king's table forever. And, and so exterminate, I said, exterminator of shame. And so I love how God just shifted that thing. And, and so before anything bad happened to him, he was saying, this is who I'm speaking into you. This is who you are. You all are, I am an exterminator of shame. Shame's not going to take me out. I'm destroying shame. And so, you know, he, God called him. God foretold his victory. God foretold our victory. We don't have to live like that any longer. We are exterminators of shame. Yeah. And so that's our story. It doesn't matter who dropped it. It doesn't matter how broken you are. It doesn't matter who, who spoke curses against you, who made fun of you, who bullied you. It doesn't matter that you hate it yourself. God's saying you are an exterminator of shame. I can turn this thing around. Your mistakes in life don't have to be your identity any longer. You know how many times you're so angry with yourself because of your choices or mistakes you made. You have to let it go. You heard the word. Let it go. You know, so these circumstances can be changed in a moment. That's what the Lord is saying. I want you to get a revelation of what I want to do for you, how I want you to understand that I'm, the Lord's not looking at us like, oh, here they come again. They're going to come and bother me with this problem again. No, he meets us where we're at. And he's saying, listen, I want you to learn to accept yourself and my love for you and what I have for you. You're not a low life. You're not a dirt bag. You're not someone who's a mistake. You're someone whom I love. And when I died on the cross, I thought of you. I thought of you. I thought of all the people who would struggle. What does it say in Isaiah 53? He rejected the shame. Look at what happened to him. He's naked on the cross. He was brutally beaten and people, and that could, I mean, just think about his peers thinking, oh my God, we thought he was our deliverer. He's the loser. He was killed. He's defeated. No, that wasn't it at all. Right. There's resurrection life coming. You see how we don't understand a lot of times, but could, could you imagine? Because he was still human. He wasn't God when he was going through that. What he, he experienced, Peter denied him the betrayal. Oh my gosh, so you have shame, you have rejection, you have, you know, he had all these things happening to him. So he knows what, he's, he knows what we experience. Yes. And so, anyway, so, they, you know, um, um, what's his name? <laughs> no, David. So David encouraged him. And David said to him, you will sit at my table. You are welcome in this palace, wow. and everything I have is yours. Wow. See, but that's God saying that to us. Yeah. 
We are seated in heavenly places. And he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. It's for all of us. Yeah. It's not, you know, when you go into prayer, just sometimes it's like you're not connecting with the Lord. And the Lord's saying that time is over with. There's a connection that he wants to make with us. He wants us to understand his amazing love. And I just, I, you know, as I was really studying this thing the whole day, I just thought, man, it's just so obvious. Not that it wasn't before, but it's just so obvious how the enemy has tried to steal and waste time from all of us. Yes. But the beauty is that God redeems our time. Thank you, Lord. I, you know, no matter what I thought about, God gave me another screw. He says, I redeemed that time. He said, the time that you even thought that you wasted, he said, I'll redeem that. Yes. And so... You know, let, is the Lord knocking on your heart? You know, I was thinking about, he's saying, let me in so that I can deal with the root system of shame in your heart. And he said, and, and again, we're going to silence those voices. Because one of the definitions, I don't know if you remember, meant whisperer, whisperer or shame. He whispers in our ears, not good enough, your hair's not nice enough, your hair's not thick enough, this isn't good enough, you know, I don't know about men thinking about those things, maybe you're not good in sports, maybe you're not strong enough, I don't know what men go through, but um, women have, what? They're afraid of being called a, a weakling. A weakling, you're not strong enough, you know, so, or, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to put the, the zipper on my mouth and I'm not going to say anything. One of the thing, one of the definitions also meant, I think it meant mute. I, I forget, but we have to, we have to, what we have to do to shame is, is mute that button. And I forget what was that lady, Gannette beef to who came here, what she say? Mute. You know, keep it, keep your mouth shut. Keep, keep the lies, you know, shut. Don't allow the enemy to speak to us. Put shame on mute. Don't listen to the lies. Put shame on mute. I'm not listening to the I'm flawed. I'm, I can't, I'll never acquire anything. I'm stupid. I'll never get a degree. Don't listen to any of that stuff. So, and what we have to do is, is ask Jesus to help us. Lord, show me, you know, the process in getting free. So what I did here now in closing, you know, now I wanted to just shift over about certain prayers and how we can get free. Now, remember, Mephibosheth for the long time was lame. See, we're not lame anymore. You become lame in the spirit when you don't accept who you are in Christ. All right. Your identity as a woman of God, as a man of God, as one who is, you know, a victorious individual. The Bible says that we're more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us. Right. He's, he, you know, more than, right? And so that's, he didn't say, well, based on your circumstances, based on your economics, based on what, you know, where you grew up. No, this is what he says about all of us. The Bible literally says in Jeremiah that we're dread champions, right? right? So, you know, this is how God sees us. So, so what are some of the keys to victory? Well, number one, I had to, I had to renew my mind with truth. That was essential. I had, I, I had gotten scriptures out. You know, you have a lot of the scripture books that you can get, but scriptures on the love of God and, and, and scriptures, you know, who we are in Christ. You know, I get those scriptures and meditate on those. And, and honestly, at the time when I was so bound by this, I thought, how in the world is this going to help me? <laughs> you know, because the natural mind doesn't understand the spiritual. But I chose to, I said, Lord, I can't live like this any longer. I chose to get the word and meditate on it and speak it over myself. And it was a process for me. It was a process. So what are some of the keys, right? So that, that's a real important key, but confessing to the Lord where you're at, not blame shifting, not, well, I'm this way because of so-and-so. No, we have to own our own stuff. Okay. So just go before the Lord and confess your sin. And we're going to pray through some of this. All right. In a minute. So confession is very important. Not berating yourself. Not beating yourself up, just saying, yeah, I blew it. Or, yes, forgive me for believing that lie for so many years. Forgive me for aligning with shame where I was so one with it. Sometimes you have to break a soul tie with it, you know. So then you repent. Ask God to forgive you. And then we renounce it, you know, to give it up. Voluntary. I, I, I don't want any part of it any longer. Shame, I don't want any part of you. I don't, I'm not listening to you any longer right then you forgive yourself and you forgive others 
right? Sometimes forgiving yourself is harder than forgiving others. But choosing to forgive yourself, because that's not a noble thing, harboring unforgiveness. It's going to keep you in bondage. So choose to forgive yourself, all right? And then, uh, then there's deliverance. Then we take authority over the spirits. And now listen, not everybody has a spirit of shame. But if you do, we cast it out. No big deal. But, but it's a mindset that we have to understand that we, we have to renew our minds and, and choose to accept the word over what the Lord is saying about who we are, choosing to let go of the lies. Now, I get it when it's so entrenched inside of you, when you feel that when it's, you're so one with it. I, believe me, I know, I lived it. But, but the word of God is supernatural, and it sets you free. And I, I, I really would, I mean, I would go after this thing and choose to worship. And, and Lord, I thank you. I, and, and, and here's the thing. Even when I would say, Lord, I thank you that I'm, you know, that you love me and, and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And I'd quote Psalm 51 and Psalm 139. There were times I wanted to spit. I didn't even believe it at the time, but I was doing it by faith. Yeah. I said, Lord, because I would have this tumble going on inside of me, this rumble, and, and just really struggling with this, but I just chose to do it. And, you know, and I'm telling you, he comes to set us free. He meets us right where we're at. That's yeah. the beauty of God. It's not, he's not, he's very simple. He's not complicated. And when you, when you have that desperation, when you have that hunger that you want freedom, you know, he's so happy. When, when we're dealing with people in ministry and that person comes and they're fasting and they're already had their scriptures and they're already, oh, my God, it's such a delight because it's easy. Yeah. I mean, that person, you know, they've been working on themselves. We're just the midwives. He's the deliverer. Yeah. So anyway, so anyway, so what are some so the steps of deliverance? Confession, as I said. So I have here. I'm going to just read through it and then we'll pray. Okay. So now again. Don't get caught up in a verbiage. You can say it however you want, all right? So I just wrote here, Father, I confess before you every unconfessed sin that I'm aware of, especially blah, 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 whatever it is. And sometimes we're really not even aware of stuff. I don't believe we have to dredge up everything. Ask Holy Spirit what we need to identify, what we have to address at this point. And listen, there are different seasons in our life. I've been doing deliverance for a long time. And there have been times, and I shared this when I was teaching in Rejection, uh, you know what 10 years ago I had to have um, a spirit of rejection no it was depression cast out of me I don't know why it didn't happen when I went all through the deliverance in the beginning but there are seasons so all I know if there's something there I'm not going to try to you know intellectualize it I'm going to go for it and get free right so we confess and then so ask the Lord and this you can do on your own too because you do want to take time with this because remember it's all it's not only can it be a spirit but it's a mindset it's a mindset that has to shift all right so then ask holy spirit for discernment ask the holy spirit you know show me things show me bring to remembrance the things that i need to i'm discerning that my husband wants to say something because i'm really proud of her i saw the first hand you know from when we got married to um, the process that she went through and um, there's a lot of verses going through my mind, but one is in Romans 8:28 that God makes all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purposes, right? And Trisha always knew that she was called, uh, but she had a lot of uh, repeating lies in her brain that uh, it's like muscle memory. You know, you just get into a habit of thinking less of yourself than you should. And I can um, remember thinking that that warrior that she had to be growing up then turned into somebody who was willing to face the fear. So one of the things about her story is, you know, she had to face fear a lot growing up and that nobody would choose that. You know, nobody would want to be in that kind of an environment. Um, so that might look like, you know, like you don't want to be violent as a Christian, but you do have to contend for your healing. So find out where the lies are embedded in your brain about yourself and what you believe about yourself, and then counter those lies openly. Like, I remember her standing in front of the mirror and pointing at herself in the mirror, which might sound crazy, but it's not. It's really powerful for your voice to hear an opposite uh, truth to the lie that was spoken over you and break agreement with that lie. 
and if you're not dealing with this yourself, but you have other people in your life, it might be hard for you to understand it. Like if you didn't deal with a lot of this, which personally I didn't deal with a lot of it growing up and I had a lot more validation just because of the family that I grew up in. I had different problems than that one, but I was, I had more confidence than that. So it was hard for me to understand. I knew what I saw in her and how much I loved her, but she didn't believe it about herself. So, you know, you don't have to try to present facts to the person. <laughs> I, mean, I, I know I did that, and that's why I know it doesn't work. You just want to <laughs> kind of sit in it with them and have an arm around the shoulder and let them know you're not going anywhere. Like, I'm not bailing on you. Because, like, you remember on the rejection part, I would tell her she loved me, and she'd say, no, you don't. And I'm like, really? Like, what are you, the expert now? Like, I'm telling you, I love you. Don't. Don't make it harder for me now. <laughs> but really, she couldn't love herself. So she couldn't believe I could love her if she couldn't love herself. And you know, that tenacity is one of the things I loved, is that nobody's perfect. Like, we all know that. But, but to not just feel the pity party and to hide from it, but to face it, um, I'm trying to give some of you courage to know that it, in, on a scale, it doesn't matter if your life doesn't look as bad as somebody else. To you, it was bad. Right? So you don't have to compare yourself to anybody. Just say, now I'm, I'm loved unconditionally by God. He's my father. And maybe your father, like in Trisha's case, she lost him tragically to death. And, you know, the, it was a trauma that she experienced that, you know, happened at a relatively young age. And, you know, that can, that can make you feel shame, too. Like, I don't, I don't have somebody to go to get advice, you know, like you would with her father was a loving man and, and, and loved her. But that was a big gap, a big void. One more thing, you know, of, of, of feeling lack of. Um, so then it's like, I don't know, you know, do, do I trust the man? Like, maybe I shouldn't let my guard down. You know, maybe he's going to bail on me, too, right? Because, you, you, you know think it could happen again so your guards up right now 35 years later not going anywhere so be that person for the one who's not believing in themselves because by you acting contrary to what they believe about themselves you help counter that lie <laughs> thank you well, and the other thing, too, when you're going through a lot of this, there's no rhyme or reason to it. Like, a lot of it didn't even make sense. I mean, I was a cutter. I mean, I would cut, and then I would go in a mirror, and I would kneel on the vanity and, and cut my face. And uh, with a, I would get a paper clip or a safety pin, what, like that. So I would, you know, and I remember thinking, why am I doing this? But there was so much inner rage inside. And, and at that time, I never heard of cutting. I never heard of anybody cutting. But there was, there was just so much pent up in me that I didn't understand any of that. I didn't know why I'm doing it. And, and it would really set me up because there were times that I just felt this urge to do it. And I, had, I was going out. And then here you are embarrassed because you have, you know, welts and cuts on your face. You know, it's not exactly the way you want to look. But, you know, I mean, there were just different things that, that was so diabolical that, that you would just tap into and, and not understanding anything. Like even when, it, when Peter did say, you know, like if he said, you know, he loved me. And I'm like, no, he doesn't. And, you know, I just didn't believe it. Because if I don't believe it about myself, how can, how can, just like what I'm saying, you believe you're flawed. How can anyone love you? My, my mindset was you had to be a certain way. You had to look a certain way. You had to have a certain degree. You had a same, certain pedigree in order to be loved. Well, how untrue is that? But how, how diabolical is that? Now when I look back, I think, girl, what was your problem? But it was something that I believed, and now it's like, oh, my gosh. But thank God for the blood. Yeah. Like that word, thank God for the power of the cross. Yeah. Thank God for Jesus. That's why we need classes like this. That's why we need to know that we don't have to be stuck in our mess. That Jesus came to set us free. So we confess it. And we confess everything, every sin, every time that we hated ourselves. We confess that every time we hated somebody else or blamed somebody else. We confess that before the Lord. He's not there with a mallet ready to hit us over the head. He loves us. And, and it's just, you know, you know, when you're processing with someone, you're, you're, you're sharing everything, you're getting off your chest, you know, it's healing yeah. and you bring it before the Lord and then ask Holy Spirit, what, what, is there anything else that I'm missing? Is there something else that I'm saying, you know, or that I should say rather, you know, but don't, you don't have to dredge everything up because there's process and let him do it for you. All right. 
And then, uh, you know, we know this scripture, Lord, search my heart and try me, reveal to me my shortcomings, that I can repent of them. Listen, why am I saying that? Because there's disassociation. When you've been in a lot of pain, and for those in trauma, or those who have been sexually abused, physically abused, you disassociate. You don't remember things. How many times have we met with people? I don't have any recollection for the first five years. I don't have any recollection whatsoever. Not all of it's sexual abuse, but there's been physical abuse. There's been some kind of trauma that occurred in their lives. That, that Holy Spirit, when he thinks you're ready, will reveal it to you. All right, then you, forgiveness is you choose to forgive everyone. You know, again, I, I said that before, but, you, you know, with whom you feel that it may have wronged you and yourself. I mean, that's really important. So I wrote here, Lord, I choose to forgive each of the following people who have wrong, hurt or wronged me. I choose to forgive them. And thank you for healing my wounding heart. And I should have put, and I choose to forgive myself. You know, let the whole, see, here's the deal about forgiveness. The Holy Spirit comes in and brings the healing. Yeah. We're, it, it's our act of obedience. We choose to forgive, okay? Sometimes you're hurt so, so terribly that the thought of forgiving that individual you're, in your mindset is like, I'm letting them off the hook. Well, you're really not. You're letting yourself off the hook. Because you're then an open prey for the enemy. See, that's, that's, the, that's the thing that we don't recognize. When we are walking in forgiveness, we are an open door for the enemy to attack us. Right. And you don't get free. Right. So it's, Lord, uh, it's not, God will deal with them. And remember, they have their own set of issues. Hurt people hurt people. And so, but, but at the time when you're so terribly wounded, and I'm not saying it's an easy thing, you know, when you're so terribly wounded, it's, Lord, I, I choose to forgive them. Help me to see them through your eyes. Right. 